Hello, lovely humans. Welcome back to another episode of the Lovely Humans Club podcast. I literally recorded that first one and then just sat on it for like mm, two months. <laughs> Maybe no, it's been longer. <laughs> oh, I have lipstick on my teeth. Good thing this is a podcast. You can't see that, but you could see it on the video version that I've released over on my YouTube channel, which is the Jamie Wolfer. Um, because Jamie Wolfer was already taken by my main channel where I talk about wedding stuff. If you're new here, hey, my name is Jamie Wolfer. I am a wedding planner that became a content creator, and I just simply love talking into microphones. So I have to invent ways of doing that um, repeatedly until I absolutely crumble under the weight of my own doings. That doesn't make any sense. In today's podcast, we are going to be talking about motherhood and entrepreneurship, which is such a... mm, This topic gets me going. (laughs) Anyways, like you wouldn't believe because it seems to be taken over by the MLM pushers and the mommy bloggers. And uh, there's like a stigma. There's like a thing around it. It, it, Especially, especially in light of the ballerina farms article that just came out recently if you if you don't know ballerina farms is hannah and daniel neilman neilman i I think it's neilman this totally adorable mormon couple that lives i think in utah which would not be a stretch or a surprise and they have they just had their eighth child she's a home birthing i think she homeschools homesteader they just opened up their own raw dairy like I love so many aspects about their life. You know, we might not agree on everything theologically, but there's a lot of stuff that she does that I'm like, that is cool. That is goals. Well, a a journalist, and I use that term very, very loosely, came and uh, interviewed her and then ended up writing a pretty, what seemed to me, a pretty scathing article after the fact that made it sound like Hannah from Ballerina Farms was very much oppressed in her marriage and was forced into it. There was a lot of, you know, nuanced language that ended up giving the overall sensation that, you know, Miss Hannah had left her dream at Juilliard because this man had forced her to. Um, And there's a lot around this topic of moms and working and trad wife and girl boss. And there's all these terms that are flying around that, you know, for some of us, I'm like, I kind of identify with like a, a smorgasbord, smorgasbord of some of those, <laughs> like an amalgamation of some of them and not just one or the other. And while we're not going to do a deep dive into the, you know, ballerina farms situation, I think she's well within her rights to change her dreams. You know, Juilliard only lets in a handful of dancers a year, I think. I think it's like 12. And she walked away from that. And there has to be a pretty powerful pull to want to walk away from that. Regardless, she did. And now she has a thriving social media platform. They just opened up, I guarantee you, what was a very expensive dairy. They can afford to feed and clothe eight children. I don't know. To me, it seems like they're living the dream. To me, it seems like she's living the dream. She is allowed to be an entrepreneur and be a mom and use her momming as a part of her entrepreneurship. And here is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the ways that motherhood helps me as an entrepreneur, because these are the conversations that I think we should be having. Instead of trad wife versus girl boss, how do we make our lives work while fulfilling all of the dreams we want to have (laughs) in the most feasible way possible, which I am an Enneagram 3. And if you know nothing about the Enneagram, I am a people pleaser. Uh, I do great on stage. Nobody's surprised. Nobody's surprised. I am very goal oriented. I very much want to grow this platform out into being something totally epic and totally awesome. Um, As I do with all of my other ones because I cannot be stopped. So for me, I'm like, I still want to live my favorite dream life and raise my kids the way I want to raise my kids. I want to be uncompromising. And that means that I have to learn lessons. (laughs) Write that down. If you want to be uncompromising, you have to learn lessons. It's not just about being hard and making decisions and, you know, not changing your mind. It's about taking the time to learn the lessons and making changes as you go so you don't compromise on the things that truly matter. So after that five minute intro rant, let's get into the meat and potatoes of today's podcast. The first way that motherhood helped me as an entrepreneur is boundaries boundaries. If you guys don't know, or if you missed the very first episode of this podcast, I do recommend that you go back and listen to that. It's the about me. It's the story that I've never told on the internet. And there's definitely still details of my life that will probably never be told on the internet. Okay. So it's not all of it. (laughs) It's not all of the nitty gritty, but the biggest thing I revealed in that podcast that still hasn't gone live, um, that I still haven't shared. (laughs) 
so I don't know what the reaction to it is, but I'm sure it's gonna be fine, is that I was a single mom for years and we didn't have a lot of money and I had no financial support. I did it all on my own and I was a single mom with twins. So it's not like it's just one. Like we we really had to rough it there for a while and that's where I got scrappy and that's where I learned how to handle my finances because it's not like anyone was just gonna sweep in and save me. You know, I had to figure out how to feed my kids. I couldn't just keep hoping for a white night. Um, I ended up getting one eventually and he's incredible and I'm so glad we get to do life together. But I learned a lot the hard way. I learned a lot the hard way. One thing that the girls did for me, I called them my baby bouncers. They kind of made it so I couldn't make a lot of bad decisions. I couldn't go out late at night. Not that I was really interested in doing that anyways, but I couldn't because <laughs> I didn't have a sitter. I couldn't just date anybody I wanted because not everybody wants to date somebody with kids and nor should they, right? That's everyone has the right to say whether they want to or not. Anyways, they, they just kind of created these enforced boundaries. I couldn't just spend what I wanted to spend on things. I couldn't just go places that I wanted to go. I had to start being a lot more strategic um, and I had to learn how to say no to things because I just couldn't do it because my kids came first. They had to because literally there was no other adult that could take care of them. So when we got married and then I immediately started my wedding planning business like a month and a half later, I couldn't, I still couldn't just like go and work whenever I wanted to. I had to be very strategic. I literally could not just give my all to my clients. I had to have something left over for my husband and my kids at the end of the day, which meant that I had to get really good at boundaries really quickly because I talk about this a lot. I have a mentorship where I help other planners get their business started. And one of the main tenants that we talk about in that mentorship is boundaries. And here is why I, I told I told this to someone recently. I think it was my dad. I'm like, honestly, starting this business was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I'm such a people pleaser and I would want to say yes to everything that people are asking me to do, especially as a wedding planner. This is someone's wedding day. I have to say yes. And then I realized that the amount of things I was saying yes to was because of my own insecurities, because I wanted them to like me and I wanted them to think I was doing a good job that I ended up getting myself into hot water by not having boundaries. No, you cannot call my phone at 11 p.m. at night because I have to wake up with my kids tomorrow morning. No, you cannot give your, my phone number to your mother so she can text me anytime she wants. I have to be available for my kids. I can't be available 24 seven to answer all these questions, especially to someone who's not even my client. No, I cannot go to all of these appointments with you. I have to set boundaries on the amount of time that you have access to me, which seems counterintuitive for the way that people view wedding planners. But I also don't think it's a coincidence that most event planners can't last longer than five years because they burn out from the stress because they don't have boundaries. So because I literally had kids to wake up for in the morning because I had to make meals, pack lunches, help with homework. This was back when they were going to traditional school and now we homeschool. I could not be available at all times. Otherwise I just would get burnt out. And I knew that I had to start instituting something. And that burnout feeling didn't just stop there. It was also directly correlated to my pricing. I reached a point where I realized I need to make enough money to make it worth my while to be away from my children. If I'm going to be missing out on nights and weekends, then I need to make sure that I'm being compensated accordingly. I need to make sure that I'm actually bringing home an income. A lot of times when we get started in business, we're like, oh, I'm not worth it. You know, I haven't, I haven't worked in this industry long enough. I shouldn't be charging this amount of money. Who am I to say that like, I know what I'm doing. I don't. So I'm going to undersell myself and over deliver, right? I'm not going to have good boundaries. And I'm going to make sure I'm cheap. So hopefully they'll feel better about my services. And I don't feel like I'm going through imposter syndrome. Well, that doesn't last very long with children, <laughs> which is why it's another thing that I preach over my mastermind in the mentorship where I'm like, you need to charge enough money to make money. You need to charge enough money that makes it worthwhile so you don't burn out. Because even when you start having good emotional boundaries and good work boundaries, if you're not making enough money, why are you doing it? And then kids come into the picture. This is when so many women go, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to work at this business anymore because it's not worth my time correction, you're not being paid what your time is worth. And that's because you're not setting your pricing accordingly. So when I started off, I had three different packages. My lowest package was $1,000. And a lot of people were like, that seems bold. And I was like, well, I mean, in the grand scheme of wedding planners, it really wasn't. But I saw so many other planners starting like 500. And I immediately went, that's new. That's because you're new. You don't know where to put your pricing. And so you're just hoping that people hire you and then you can work long enough to feel confident enough to maybe raise your pricing eventually. I didn't have that luxury. I could not do that. I couldn't see putting all of this time into this business only to just burn out a handful of years later because I didn't feel good about my pricing. 
That one felt a little bit like following a bouncing ball, but hopefully it rounded out nicely at the end to make sense. If you are a mom and an entrepreneur and you want to keep pursuing entrepreneurship, but you find that it's just not worth your time, then you're not charging what your time is worth. The next thing that actually took me, unfortunately, a little a little time to learn um, was clear communication. <laughs> Once I started getting these boundaries into place, my, gorgeous, we love boundaries. We love them so much. And honestly, the clients ended up thriving even better when I gave them. Just like, oh, I should have made this point when I was talking about boundaries earlier. My kids do better when they have a bedtime. They're not as cranky. They're more fun to be around. They're well rested. My kids do better when they eat three square meals a day. They're not snacking on junk food. They're not complaining about being hungry. They do better when there's structure. They do better when there's boundaries. Here's what you can do. Here's what you cannot do. No, you cannot have screen time until all your tours are done. No, you cannot go play with the neighbors until you've done X, Y, Z. No, you cannot have a snack. It's lunchtime. They do better with boundaries. And so do your clients. Now, the only way that these work, though, is you have to communicate them. And that's when I had to learn how to really firm up what my proposal looked like and what my contract looked like. Because if I wasn't clear on what I was delivering, then my client wasn't clear on what they were receiving. Perfect example. Right now, my kids are super into mochi. The, the older two are so... She's, uh, Isabel has tried making mochi on multiple kids. It's never gone well, but she's tried. And they, they just love mochi. And so oftentimes... And now she's 14. The twins are 14. So they're a little... Bit, they, they, they know things. Um, and she will go, can I have some mochi? And I will go, you may have two pieces of mochi. She goes, oh. I was hoping you'd say like three or four. Nope, you may have two. When a client asks, how many meetings do we get with you? I can say very simply, based on your contract and the package that we have together, you have five. If you'd like to have any additional meetings, here's going to be the fee for that. Oftentimes I find with this time period though that five should be good. We might need to add on one more just in case, but I think that the package is pretty good as is. There, very clear communication. Here's exactly what you'll be receiving from me. Here is a very clear answer to your question. It also meant that I had to be very clear in writing things down. I don't know if you've ever tried to give instructions to a child via writing. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. Um, <clears throat> It's not easy sometimes. If you are not explicitly clear, hey, child, you need to go do your laundry. They might just throw it in the washer and then never move it to the dryer. What? I started it. <laughs> No, you need to wash your laundry, put it in the dryer, run it twice because our dryer is really old, and then take it out, fold it, and put it away and bring me back the laundry basket by the end of the day today. Boom. Clear. <laughs> Very clear. I gave step-by-step -step instructions because guess what? My kids aren't good at this. They don't know what they're doing. And guess what? My clients aren't good at this. They don't know what they're doing. So if I don't give step-by-step -step instructions, and I don't mean it in a patronizing way, not at all. All. But if I don't give clear instructions on something that's completely foreign to them, they're going to make assumptions or maybe drop the ball part of the way or not understand what they should be looking for when they're trying to find vendors. If I'm not extremely clear, both with my children and my clients, confusion sets in. I need to be the one to set the pace. I need to be the one to set the rules. And I had that unlock pretty quickly with clients. The boundaries came up relatively quick. I would say within the first year, I adjusted my pricing accordingly. Every single year, I gave myself a raise and started charging more and more. But the clear communication, the area that I struggled with the most was with other vendors. And this was like an aha moment for me uh, because we were, I will never forget this wedding because it was actually a childhood friend of mine whom I adore to pieces. And she was very excited about this videographer. And I was excited for her too. I was excited for me. Like we don't get videographers necessarily at a lot of weddings that we work because I tend to work in the more budgeted end of things. And so a videographer tends to be a treat. Well, this guy was a piece of work. He was, he was such a snot. He was such a snot. He had the photographer in tears at one moment, like literally just being like, she's crying in front of her clients and in front of him. And she seemed like a very strong, independent woman. It's not like she was timid or meek or quiet. And she's like, you're getting in all of my shots. I feel like I don't have any creative control over what we're doing here. It seems like you're just stepping in and doing these things. And this is this is really frustrating for me. And she's trying to communicate that, but she's like communicating through tears, which I totally understand sometimes when I'm really mad, I cry. <laughs> I hate that, but sometimes it happens. So I'm watching this unfold and... The client was like far enough back that she didn't hear the conversation and we're really late to start the reception, which if you are unfamiliar with how weddings go, it's the ceremony, the 
I do part, then cocktail hour where everyone mingles about and the couple usually goes off to take photos with family and or the wedding party. Um, and then you go into the reception, which is where the main meal is served while our cocktail hour was running behind. Everything was kind of running behind this day, but that's okay. We're used to it and we can handle it. But this videographer was just not listening. So I kept going, hey, how much more time do you need? Hey, how much more time do you need? And I like to give them room to like express their artistry as they see fit. And this guy, this guy finally whips around. And he's like, we are not starting the reception until I get my shot. I promised them a shot inside at this location in their reception. Uh, and we can't let anybody in before we do that. And I'm like, oh, I see why the photographer's crying. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So I step back and I'm like, collecting myself like what do I do what do I do because he's he's that was he's just mean he's kind of being a bully you know just not really caring about anybody around him and so my assistant who I've been friends with for years comes up and I'm like I don't know what to do she goes Jamie you're a mom you know exactly what to do go up and tell him that he can't keep filming he's gonna lose this shot unfortunately we've ran late and you need to set a boundary and communicate really clearly with him how would you say this to your kids and I was like oh and it was like a light bulb went off in my brain. I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. So I went up to him and I said, you know, I understand. I want to respect your art. And I want to respect the fact that you really want to get this shot. As it stands, we are 20 minutes behind schedule. And we really need to get these guests in so they can start enjoying their meal. Because I can't keep putting catering behind and the rest of the event behind. Because you're determined to get this shot. So if you would like to, you can go do that right now. But in the next handful of minutes, I will be releasing the guests into the reception space. So you will lose your opportunity. So again, want to respect your art, want to respect what you need to get done, but I have to look at the event as a whole and I can't just hyper-focus on you getting your job done. And he had some sort of quippy remark and I walked away and went, I'm a recovering people pleaser. <laughs> it was like a moment of like, oh, it was just such a great word picture of I affirm you. I see where you're coming from. I see that you have feelings about this. I see that this is important to you. Um, I am seeing it from this perspective. Let me share where I'm coming from. And let me say why I cannot accommodate you any longer. I try to affirm my kids all the time and say, I see where you're coming from. I understand. If I was in your shoes, I would feel the same way. Let me explain it from the perspective of someone who's seeing it from over here um, or from a parental point of view, how what you said affected your sibling or it's not what you said, it's how you said it. Or I see that you're angry. I'm not mad at you for being mad. It's what you do with it that matters. Acknowledgement, bigger, broader perspective. Here's what we're going to do moving forward. And from that point on, I kind of just ended up treating clients and different vendors like if they were my kids very clear boundaries. I see where you're coming from. Here's a broader perspective. And here's what we are going to do moving forward. How does that sound for you? Sometimes inviting them into the conversation or sometimes just telling them this is what's up. This is what we're going to do. You don't, you don't really get a choice here because I'm the one running the show. I've been hired to, or I'm your mom and I need to make sure that this happens. So I respect your feelings. We will be making this decision moving forward. Another way that probably falls under boundaries, but like I didn't organize my outline neat enough before starting this was availability. And this goes hand in hand with all the things we've mentioned so far with pricing, with boundaries, with communication. But I had to set up my job in such a way that I was not available Monday through Friday, nine to five. I can't. My husband's at work. At this point, we had had Silas and the girls would be at school, but I had, I'd have to get them ready in the morning, send them off to school. Then I'd be with a toddler. So I'd have a short window when he napped where I could respond to emails. But the second the girls got home, it was homework, after school snack, cleaning up, putting things away, getting dinner prepped. And then once my husband came home, it was the changing of the guards. That's when I could then go have client meetings if I needed to. So I had to be very strategic with when I was available because I literally didn't have an option. I didn't have a choice because I didn't want to be in a meeting holding my toddler because that would just be stressful and I would be unfocused and not like not feeling like I was dedicated to my clients. And I didn't think my clients would feel like I was dedicated to them either. So I sold it as a good thing, y'all. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> well, we understand that most of our clients have traditional nine to five. So we make ourselves available in the after hours and on the weekends. So that way we can be there for you in a time that's convenient for you and not schedule appointments in the middle of the day. That kind of pulls most people away from work. Boom. When yes, that was true, but the, the, the flip side of that coin was, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't. <laughs> you do not want to meet with me at 3 p.m. Let me tell you, you don't. It's going to be loud. There's going to be so many interruptions and I will look the least professional. So my availability had to change. And luckily I was able to find the silver lining and share that part with my clients <laughs> and, and not just be like, I'm a mom, so I can't do that. <laughs> and the last way that being a mom helped me as an entrepreneur, it, it would be like a Venn diagram. It'd be like the Olympics of loops here, except for they're all connected in a way. And that's creativity. With wedding planning, your time is finite. 
right? I can only plan so many weddings at a time. There are only 52 weekends in a year, potentially three weddings a weekend. Triple headers are disgustingly exhausting. And I, one thing I never wanted to do, I did a couple double headers and those were, those were hard. Those were really hard. And I didn't want to be away from my kids that often. Again, boundaries, availability, pricing, all of this was kind of converging. And I went, well, I don't really want to up my pricing a heck ton more uh, because I still have a heart for these budget couples, but I need to find a way to diversify because right now I'm not really making like a ton of money. <laughs> like if I keep at the pace that I'm going, so what am I going to do? And that's when I started a YouTube channel. That's when I was like, hey, maybe I make YouTube videos to help my clients. This is literally, I was so naive to help my clients plan their weddings and so if they had questions, I could just be like, hey, I actually did a whole YouTube video on this. If you want to go watch that, especially if they were only month of coordination clients, because I, I couldn't help them for long term because they couldn't afford it. And that way I was able to set better boundaries and be like, no, I can't answer those questions for you because you literally haven't hired me to do that. But here's a super fun resource that you can go to YouTube channel that has a lot of the answers for you. So that way, when you get to me on your wedding day, I have helped you along the way without taking really much of my time at all because all that stuff is evergreen, right? Like it's just gonna keep going in perpetuity. And I can make sure you basically screw up less and you have more information, you make better decisions. So by the time you get to me on your wedding day, you will have had some guidance. So my day is easier and your day is easier. It's like a win-win for everybody. And uh, little did I know, the internet really needed this. Couples really needed this. Within four months of posting videos, I was monetized, which is, I don't know how fast people get monetized on YouTube, but that felt really fast to me. And it, it wasn't like a, a ton of money in the very beginning. In fact, it still isn't. Once COVID hit, like I am less than 50% of what I was making pre-COVID. It's like we are limping along. <laughs> and actually, a couple YouTube friends and, and I, we have a theory that something, something fishy is going on with YouTube. Like we're not getting the same amount of views. If you go on your, I don't know if it's called your For You page on YouTube, but it's always content creators with barely any views. Like they're trying to push the smaller creators and not the, I don't know, I don't know. But because I had these gorgeous, lovely kids that I was like, I gotta be available for. I also don't want my clients' wedding days to suck. I'm gonna create content for them to consume and then realize, oh my goodness, like a bunch of couples want this. I never would have done that if I didn't have kids. Well, I can't say never. I still am an Enneagram 3 and, you know, love to perform. So I, I might have. But I don't think I would have been pushed to do that, to come up with a way of serving clients without taking too much of my time and making everyone's lives easier if I didn't have kids to take care of, if I didn't have boundaries on my time, if I didn't have pricing that made sure that I made money at the end of the day. I, I don't think I would have started a YouTube channel, at least not for that. I mean, it's taken me, gosh, I started in the beginning of 2018. I mean, it's taken me this long to really lean into my personal brand because <laughs> it's a lot more vulnerable when it's just you. It's a lot more vulnerable when it's just you talking and I'm not educating people on much. I'm just sharing my life now. That channel still exists. Those podcasts over there still exist. I'm still doing things over there. It's just a uh, lot more scary and vulnerable when it's this kind of content. So regardless of what the internet wants to tell you, being a mom and an entrepreneur is actually a very symbiotic relationship. If you are willing to learn the lessons and become uncompromising, if you feel burnt out, what are you doing wrong? If your clients are calling you at all hours of the night, what boundaries do you need to put in place? If you look at your account for your business and you go, that's not a lot of money, you're not charging enough. We have to look at these different circumstances. If you are trying to be a girl boss and a trad wife at the same time, you have to make yourself available to learn the lessons and make the changes to put up the boundaries, to charge what you're worth, to communicate very clearly. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're not going to do. Here's my availability. And when things get constrained or tough with the kids, here's how I'm going to get creative with my business. And here's how I'm going to make it work for me. There aren't a lot of wedding planner YouTubers out there. There are more now than there used to be, which is cool, which I'm all for. I love community over competition with this kind of stuff. Bring it on, especially if someone else has different opinions than me, then they're going to serve an audience that needs to hear what they're talking about. And I think that's great. Being a good mom and a good entrepreneur are not mutually exclusive. Now, I have a theory on work-life balance. It's non-existent. It's not a thing. It's not a thing which I think I have an episode on this on my business podcast, but if you guys are interested in hearing more about it here, we, let's dive into that too, because gosh, I just wish someone had looked at me from the beginning and said, you could do it. You could do both. You could totally do it. It's fine. Like, yeah, there are seasons of life that are gonna look a little bit different, but you are still gonna be an incredible mom and you're still gonna be able to run your business. It's all, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Just start. Just try it. 
Maybe implement these things. Take these lessons that you're already learning from your kids <laughs> or that you have to institute because you have kids. You don't have a choice. You have to like actually make money. If not, then it's just a hobby, a very time consuming hobby, but you can do this. So I don't know where you're at in life. So many women who follow me are either uh, newlyweds coming over from my main channel or people considering becoming a wedding planner and also considering starting their families and wondering what that's going to look like. And I'm here to tell you it's totally possible. All right. You can do it. I believe in you. So that's all we have for today's episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're watching this over on my YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, if you haven't gone over, go give this a five-star review. It lets the podcast people know that like, I kind of know what I'm doing. And these episodes don't suck because I don't think they actually listen to these. <laughs> so if you liked it, give it a five-star review. Let me know what your favorite part was. I love you guys so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being such lovely humans. And until next time, bye guys.